Welcome to Aviate Alaska uh, and Titan Aircraft. I'm here with John Williams, the owner of Titan Aircraft uh, in Austinburg, Ohio. And he's going to just give us an overview of how Titan got started, the kits that you offer, and then we'll go through just some a description of different things you offer here at the Titan. All right. Yeah, the, uh, the way I uh, got started building aircraft, I guess, is I had my, my background is actually electronics engineering. And I started an uh, electronics company. We, uh, uh, I eventually bought a building for, for doing the manufacturing for the electronics. And it was a much larger building than I needed, but the price was right, so I bought it. I also had renters in the building at the time, and uh, it was a machine shop, and the machine shop, uh, the renters really weren't paying their rent, so eventually they went out of business, so I had, now I had all kinds of extra space. Well, the uh, CGS Hawk was manufactured in Cleveland, and uh, Chuck Slazarshek was the uh, uh, the owner and, and uh, um, had developed the, the CGS Hawk. And uh, and CGS was actually Chuck's glider supply, so so that's that's where that came from. So it was uh, Chuck's Lazar shed. So again, uh, back in back in those days, um, I wasn't uh, uh, too fond of either <laughs> neither uh, experimental aircraft or uh, ultralights. I had some friends that were uh, getting involved with ultralights, and they were saying, "Hey, John, you need to try this." And I, uh, I, I uh, let's say. Uh, uh, avoided the, the subject as much as possible. And there was, I remember one, one day flying into uh, Middlefield Airport and, and I'd seen a, uh, an ultralight uh, uh, just take off and it came around through the pattern and, and it was just over the top of the hangars and he went, uh, as he went out of sight over the hangars, I heard this thud <laughs> and I, I ran around to help the guy who's still trying to catch his breath. So it was, uh, uh, one of those things where, where I really wasn't fond of the idea. Probably sometime later, uh, maybe even as much as a year later, uh, CGS, and this is back probably around 85, 1985, CGS uh, had moved their operation out to the Middlefield Airport. And um, the... Uh, uh, I, I flew in there one time and I saw this, this little uh, uh, ultralight airplane sitting on the ramp. And from a distance, I could tell that it had conventional controls on it. It had flaps, ailerons, uh, rudder, and an elevator. And uh, I had, it kind of got my curiosity up, so I went over and looked at it. And I looked it over pretty good and I thought, you know, I think I'd fly this. It looks, it looks like it'd be neat. So then I found out that one of the guys that worked for me in my electronics company was the son of Chuck Slazarshek. It was Ted Slazarshek. So Ted uh, was, was uh, just working for me in the, in the electronics company. And so I got to talking to him about the, the, the Hawk and so forth. So uh, then I stopped and talked to Chuck about it. And um, Chuck had gone through some... some uh, difficult times with manufacturing. And uh, 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 so at some point I got the opportunity, oh, I, I, I know what it was, it was uh, my, the mechanic that did all the work on my airplane flew a hawk into my backyard and said, John, you have to try this, it's a hoot. And I said, well, what does it stall at? And he said, hell, I don't know, maybe someplace in the 20s, you know, someplace maybe 20, 30. And, uh, so I jumped in it, took off, and of course we lived out in the country, so there were cows and stuff in the field. So I started chasing cows around <laughs> with this at treetop level, and talk about fun. I just it kind of put the fun back into flying. So I I kind of got interested in in it at that point. So I started talking to Chuck then about, um, uh, you know, what what was going on with the manufacturing of that of that airplane because I really thought that it had some promise. And, uh, and he was trying to, to uh, do some manufacturing, and, and uh, he, he was looking for investors to put money in. And I, so finally, I made a proposal to him. I said, hey, Chuck, I have space in my building, and uh, I could actually uh, manufacture this. I said, you know, I, I just want to, I said, if you have all your documentation, tell me what your costs are and so forth, I can put together a, a, a proposal for you to um, price per airplane. 
and we could build these things for you at, at uh, our facility. And, uh, and of course we were only, you know, like we're 30 miles away. So, uh, so he gave me all of his documentation. I went through it and we arrived at, at, a, at a deal where I'd build these airplanes for him for a certain price. Well, the year that I got together with Chuck, he had sold three airplanes. And it was primarily because uh, the, the way the industry works is you put your money down up front and, uh, uh, but a lot of people didn't want to put their money down, especially after coming and looking at his facility where he had a small hangar with basically um, uh, stuff scattered all over the place. It was, you know, it wasn't a, a manufacturing facility. So, um, so that year he'd sold three airplanes and over the next three years, we did 120 airplanes. And that's, that's how I got uh, the bug then for, for uh, uh, building the, the airplanes. And of course it was very interesting because uh, uh, no holds barred. I mean, you could really do in the ultralight uh, industry, you could do whatever you wanted to do. So, so I was able to experiment with a lot of different things. And of course I had the passion for, for aviation. I, you know, since I was, you know, uh, pr probably <laughs> three years old when I remember looking at P, watching P-51 Mustangs fly through uh, from, from the Air National Guard flying around Ohio. So, uh, and, and of course I always had the passion for the P-51. And we had a P-51 that was based at uh, the, the Geauga County Airport there in Middlefield. And so I was able to, uh, to do a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, research in, in, uh, uh, on, on that particular airplane. And even the mechanic that worked on my airplane also worked on the, on the 51. So he had all the manuals and, and so forth. So I was able to actually copy all the manuals on, uh, you know, for that. So, because that was, I guess my passion was always that I wanted a P-51 and, uh, and I was beginning to think that the only, the only way I was ever going to get one, of course, when I first started flying, you could buy a P-51 for $2,500, but, but, uh, uh, but $2,500 was a lot of money then. And, and, uh, and then at, uh, I think that the one that was based at, at our airport, I don't know what the guy paid for it, but I know when he sold it, he sold it for $75,000, and that was in the late 80s. So um, uh, anyway, that, but as time went on, the, 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 the cost and the cost of operation of, that, of the P-51 just kept, kept increasing. Anyway, so what, what happened with the, with the Hawk is, is over the next three years then with selling that many airplanes, it kind of got Chuck back on his feet um, and, uh, and he was able to uh, take over the manufacturing uh, uh, himself. And, and I, uh, I guess at that point I wanted to, to do uh, my own aircraft and that's how we got involved with the, with, with the Tornado. Jay's the Mustang. Uh, when, when uh, again, my, my passion was always the, the uh, P-51 Mustang. So I, I wanted to, to build this. So probably through the 90s while we're doing, while we're building uh, as many tornadoes as we, as we can. We were, and we were very busy with that. And, uh, but, but I still, every chance I got, I'd, I'd look at, at things on, on the Mustang. Uh, um, but but there were several false starts on the on the Mustang where, where I tried to uh, I tell the guys we're going to get going on the Mustang, and and something else would get in the way. Well, one of the things that got in the way was the S model, and another thing that got in the way was the SS model, <laughs> and uh, so so these these things you know so you'd have to spend your engineering time on that rather than, but we did uh, we managed to to put together a. One of the, a couple of things that I wanted to do from a conceptual standpoint was the uh, was the flat sides on the uh, on the fuselage, 
and and I wondered if that was really going to because the, the, on the original Mustang, there is a very uh, it, they're almost flat, but they're not perfectly flat, and uh, so so I thought well if we it, it's easy to it's a lot easier to make it flat, and will that work? Will it look right if it is flat? So so I actually we did we build a mock up, put put skins on it, flat sides and so forth, and it looked great. And I thought well this this is going to work. So it's one of the, one of the most difficult things on the on the Mustang was was deciding what what airfoil to use. So I actually was able to call Harry Riblet. Uh, he was still alive at the time. I called him and, and talked to him. Very personable, very very helpful. And and I kind of settled on. I told him what I was trying to do, and and we both agreed that this one airfoil would probably work uh, for what for what we wanted to do. But I, I I actually built a wing. In fact, the wing's right over there. That uh, that was uh, a uh, would go fit on the tornado, but it was a, um, a riblet airfoil, and and I figured, well, I can fly that. I can put it on a tornado, fly it, and do all my measurements and find out if it really does what he says it's going to do. So we did that, and and I flew it, and there's no question. I mean, it did exactly. I mean, it came. I couldn't believe how close it was to his uh, predicted numbers. So, uh, so then I, uh, when we started to do the, I was very confident when we did the uh, wing for the for the Mustang that it was going to work as well as it did. So that's that's uh, that that took that that big hurdle uh, uh, help, helped with that. So then it was a matter of just getting going on on this thing. I decided I have to do it now. So so shortly after Oshkosh, and in fact it was August I think 29th. 27th or 29th of uh, uh, 2001, I took uh, the four guys in the in the company that I wanted working on the project. I took them to lunch, and I said, "When we go back from lunch, you guys are not working on anything else but the Mustang. Not, I don't I don't care what happens. You're, you guys, because we had other people that were working on other things. Was, we worked we worked our butts off on on that airplane. So what happened was. We, we went back to, to work, and of course, probably things would have been interrupted, except that two weeks later we had 9/11, and with 9/11 the phones just quit ringing. You know, th people people went into hibernation. You know, you could. I remember going to stores at, at after 9/11. You know, in, in like even even around Christmas time, you could go in the stores and stores were empty. So it actually allowed us. The gave us the uh, the time to to put that effort into developing this. So by um, it was actually um, uh, well, I, I wanted to actually get the airplane to uh, to Sun and Fun that year. So in April, we we actually uh, uh, I wanted it to be finished by that time, but it was almost. But well, we took it to, to Sun and Fun anyway, and, and it was so close to being finished, and we put it on display. And it was yeah. actually May when I flew, did the uh, first flight in it, so it was a, a month later. So it actually took us about nine months to, to develop the, the, uh, the Mustang. And it did, and it did everything. And then the original was, a, was powered by Rotex 9, 912S. That was the other thing that was important with, with that, with my experience with the 912S, that 100-horsepower engine. Was, there were, there was, those are big horses, <laughs> and uh, and I knew that it had the power to fly uh, fly this. And actually, the prototype would would cruise at 150 miles an hour on five gallons an hour. The the the, the prototype actually stalled at 39 miles an hour. You can put it in anywhere, you know. So it was a very safe airplane, and that's what I was really looking for something something that looked the part, you know, looked the macho uh, Mustang, but but was. Uh, uh, friendly and, and not going to hurt you. So 